everyone, and welcome to our weekly Tuesday webinar. Um, I am Anna Hall, the CEO of the Northeast Charter Schools Network, and I am momentarily pinch hitting for Yomika Bennett, um, who will take over the reins um, shortly. Uh, she got called away um, on an important call just uh, before the webinar kicked off. Um, so at the top of today's webinar, I'm really excited and so appreciative to welcome Paul Overbaugh, who oversees the uh, New York State Education Department's Transportation Office. Um, we're going to lead off with some transportation-specific questions before we dive into the other content um, and thank Paul very, very much for his time and then give him his time back um, so that we can um, move on to other topics. So, Paul, thank you again so much for taking the time to join us. And as I'm sure you're really aware, transportation is always a fraught topic between districts and charter schools. Um, and many charters are currently failing in limbo as districts are developing plans, uh, and charters are developing plans without a lot of intersections or clear um, linkages to what the hybrid plans that many schools ultimately want to implement, um, whether that's uh, immediately or in four to six weeks, and whether that will be at all aligned with what the transportation districts are willing or able to make available. So to that end, uh, we have some transportation specific questions. Um, that we've prepared in advance. If time allows, we'll take a couple from the Q&A. Um, but I do also want to um, just frame this topic by saying that um, Paul is not the um, director of pupil transportation for every district in the state. Um, and so he's not going to be able to speak necessarily to super specific district specific questions. Um, but I think some of these broad sector wide questions um, would be really fruitful and um, uh, are aligned with questions that we've received from schools about transportation. So with that, um, Paul, if you're willing, we'll, uh, we'll dive in. Sure, please do. And thank you for having me. So appreciate it. So um, if you could start off by speaking to this question of what is the legal obligation of districts to provide transportation to charter schools generally, not even in the COVID context? And then is it to that, uh, to the point of the legal obligation, is it possible that if a district elected to stop providing transportation to private schools, um, then they could also not provide transportation to charter schools? Yeah, well, when it comes to transportation, charter schools are considered as non-public schools. So it is the district's responsibility to provide the transportation uh, for the charter school as they would the non-public school. And if even in our high, the hybrid situation where some schools are going to virtual learning, the, they still should be providing transportation for charter schools and non-public schools at the same time. And what if they just say we are providing no transportation to any non-public schools and therefore um, stop providing transportation equitably to both um, private schools and charter schools? Is that possible? If that does happen and you pursue the proper channels through the school district and reach out to the superintendent and the board of education and they still say no, then I would suggest that the charter school file a 310 appeal with the commissioner of education and then also request to stay until that decision is determined to provide the transportation. And I don't think that um, there's been a commissioner's decision that would support, you know, not providing transportation when uh, the schools are in session, even virtual in session. That's super helpful. Um, and so then what about, oh, I'm sorry, I lost my, um, uh, what about special education transportation for students with IEPs? Does that follow similar um, sort of parameters or are there different considerations and guidance that you would provide in that context? Well, I believe that the IEP would set precedent over any other stipulation that we have uh, because we're talking about the individual needs of a specific child who has a disability and we want those needs to be met and serviced for the child's benefit and the child's education. So the district must follow the IEP uh, and if they can't, they need to make arrangements for some other alternative services to be provided. In some cases, I, I know where the school would send out someone to the, the non-public school or the charter school to provide the services for the child because they could not get the bus transportation to bring the child to get to the services at the school. So there's many different options that could be considered and worked through. 
That's great. So then, um, to the extent that you're aware, can you describe how districts are going through their planning processes related to transportation? And in that context, do you have any recommendations for charter schools about how to engage in that process in the most um, sort of productive way as opposed to, um, you know, sort of uh, being perceived as another problem or another um, handout in a very complicated situation? So I, I think that the important thing for a charter school to do is to communicate early. Um, the, high, the plans are all over the map, so we really don't know what each individual district is doing, but as they have committed their plans to the, and submitted their plans to uh, the DOH, then definitely the, the non-public schools and the charter schools specifically should get involved and, would, and contact them and have a communication and a, and a discussion to cooperatively work out the transportation needs and to make sure that transportation will be provided. And the other thing that comes to mind is that if they, if they are not able to provide transportation to the non-publics or the charter schools, they should not also be able to provide transportation to the public schools. We ran into that mm -hmm. situation last year with, with some non-public schools out in the western part of the state where we received calls that said, you know, we're not getting transportation. So when I reached out to the district, they were not even able to provide transportation for their public school students either because of some difficulties they were having at the time. But I believe they did resolve all those difficulties and provide transportation at, at, at the end of, of the day, so. That's great advice. Um, and so just to stamp that, you know, schools that are listening in, if you haven't already um, proactively shared your hybrid learning plans and return to physical instruction um, timing with your district in the context of transportation, absolutely, um, you know, make a point to do it now. So then Paul, this is but like follow up question. So if a charter school does that, um, and in the near future or at any point over the course of the next school year, feels like they have done their level best um, to communicate and collaborate related to transportation issues and feel like they're hitting a brick wall um, or things can't be resolved, what do you recommend that they do? Do you, is it is it to go straight to the um, appeals process that you mentioned earlier? Is there any sort of um, medium interim step of mediation or anything similar to that? Uh, normally, you can reach out to my office, and if I'm not able to resolve the situation, or if it's truly a stalemate, then I would just recommend a 310 appeal. And thank you, David Frank, for posting that website link. Uh, for the information on how to file a 310 appeal without a, a, an attorney. That's super helpful. Um, Paul, do you mind providing either your contact information or the best contact information for someone in your office? Should that become necessary? Yeah, we can do that. Fantastic. Um, and rest assured that, uh, and schools should know that we are more than happy to help um, troubleshoot and, and problem solve to the furthest extent possible before uh, before escalating in that way. Um, and so then finally, we're hearing a lot of um, challenges that are specific to New York City. Um, are any of the guidelines or reflections that you've shared um, different in the New York City context? Would you give um, any additional, would you share any additional reflections or context specific to New York City or give New York City charter schools sort of any um, additional or different guidance than what you've shared so far? I believe that in checking the New York City um, transportation page, they do provide transportation to charter schools. So therefore I would you know, try to get in as early as possible to be proactive and to see you know, what the transportation is gonna be like for the, for the coming year. So I think the same rules would apply. Uh, I know it's just a bigger, bigger context than the rest of the state. Really complicated. Um, so I'm just going to look quickly at the Q&A and see if there are any transportation related questions. Um, doesn't look like it. Um, we may field some subsequently um, in appreciation and recognition of your willingness to participate. Um, but uh, folks who are listening in, we can um, help be, oh, and now the Q&A is blowing up. Um, <laughs> um, <laughs> so it's like the this, this speak now or have, whoever, how, forever hold your peace and everyone, everyone wants Paul. Um, so uh, if a school, Paul, question from the Q&A, if a school starts fully remote and decides to move to hybrid later in the year, 
um, what should they do in order to communicate and collaborate with the district around transportation? Um, or is there some time period after which a district could um, say sort of, uh, we, we can't, you know, we won't, we won't accommodate any additional changes or requests for transportation? I think the, the district has a responsibility, even in the midst of the virtual instruction to provide the transportation. And as they come back into that hybrid model, they still need to provide the transportation. So you're saying they're not going to be able, they're going to change midstream and, and then. Well, I think some schools are, are planning to start remote, uh, to start the year doing fully remote instruction, but then return on a hybrid schedule. Um, and the, the sort of most common dates that I've seen have been sometime in October, sort of early to mid October. Um, and am I interpreting your advice correctly to say like, um, if you are in that situation or even theoretically in that situation as a school, you should be proactively communicating that to your transportation department now um, and not waiting until you're about to go back in person to say like, you know, actually, by the way, we need transportation starting next week. Yeah, the, the sooner the better so the district could prepare. I, I was thinking of the other way around where the district was going to start remotely and then the non-public or the charter school was going to start, you know, on a regular five-day schedule. Uh, but you're saying if the charter school decides to start remotely and then later on transition into a hybrid or a full five-day school. Yeah, I would definitely communicate that with the district so that they know when transportation will be needed to be provided, uh, especially if it's contract transportation where they're paying the contractor for that that service. Mm -hmm. um, and so then a couple of um, sort of um, health screening related questions or questions that relate um, to transportation. Um, are there um, uh, sort of, how are districts managing things like social distancing or temperature checks or PPE as it relates to uh, transportation? I believe the guidance from DOH and the FAQs on our SED website sort of make it clear that they are to have masks on school buses and it's up to the, the district to determine social distancing on a bus. And, and if, so if a child doesn't have a mask, then the district or the contractor should provide a mask. But I'm thinking in today's day and age, most parents will provide a mask for their child and ensure their child. And so then some of these specific questions that we're seeing about those sorts of things, temperature sque screenings, um, health questionnaires prior to getting, uh, getting on a bus, um, will buses be cleaned between routes, um, things like that. You would refer all of those questions to individual districts. Am, am I um, interpreting that correctly? Yes, I, I, would, I would check the guidance out and then also uh, go contract the district that your charter school is located in and whoever's providing the transportation to make sure that that's part of their plan and that they're complying with what needs to be complied with. Super helpful. Um, so uh, in the interest of time and other topics and to uh, respect your time, Paul, super appreciate uh, your help. Um, what I would say to schools listening in, um, certainly, um, Anjali and Corey can be resources in terms of um, conversations and specifics related to the New York City DOE. Um, schools in other geographies, if it's helpful for us to convene collective conversations um, or work to collect some of these specifics from um, district departments of transportation, um, and uh, we are happy to do that. And I would say, generally speaking, if you are having conversations um, along the lines of what Paul recommends, um, and are, they're producing information that would be useful to other schools um, or not the information that you um, hoped or expected to get back, um, please be sure to let us know so that we can be working um, as a sector, both to make it as easy as possible for our district colleagues and the state education department to support um, everyone's work, but also just to um, lend clarity when clarity is in short supply. So um, Paul, huge thank you again. Really appreciate you taking the time. Right. And you can just email me at paul.overbaugh, O-V-E-R-B-A-U-G-H, at nicet.gov. So it's paul, P-A-U-L, dot O-V-E-R-B-A-U-G-H, at nicet.gov. I think the other link that David posted was just a general link that everybody sends to 
and sometimes I get them and sometimes I don't. So it's better if you have a specific question for me that you email it to me and I'll, and I'll make sure I address it. Much appreciated. We put that uh, email address in the chat. So um, I hope you're getting uh, lots of um, love letters from uh, the charter sector. <laughs> Welcome them greatly. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Awesome. All right, so um, Yomika, um, with that, I'm gonna hand it back to you. All right, great, thank you, Anna. Um, thank you everyone for being here with us today. Thank you, Anna, for, for taking over in the last minute, I appreciate that. Um, and welcome everyone. Uh, we're gonna transition now to other topics and joining me for that discussion is are Susie Corello, Executive Director of the SUNY Charter Schools Institute, David Frank, Executive Director of the Charter Schools Office at NYSID, and Daly Matos, Executive Director for Policy and Operations at New York City Department of Education, Aaron Cochran, Managing Director in the same office, Corey Callahan from the New York City Charter Center, and of course, also with us, as always, Anna Hall, CEO, Northeast Charter Schools Network. We'll start today with some updates, uh, discuss and field some questions related to um, the state's financial plan update, and then take questions from the Q&A before turning over to New York City DOE questions. As always, remember, please, to put your questions in the Q&A. First, a few scheduling notes and some updates from the association. Join us Thursday at 4 p.m. when we will host Innovare discussing their back-to-school playbook, which we think is a strong resource for schools. Next Thursday, um, on the 27th, we will host Jeffrey Drayton and his team as they provide an overview of Teach Virtual Online, a resource that they provide for online training programs for educators. Um, and in that case, uh, they include teachers as well as parents, resources for teachers and parents. Uh, as you know, last week, the Division of Budget released the first quarterly state budget financial plan update for the fiscal year 2021. Uh, as you may recall, the enacted budget included a provision that um, for DOB to review the state finances every quarter and determine what, if any, actions need to be taken to keep the budget balanced. Uh, the state has taken actions um, over this fiscal year, which started in April, to preserve cash, including a 20% holdback of local aid payments. Uh, most of that has been seen by municipalities. Um, they've also done some other actions in terms of freezing uh, pay raises for state workers, et cetera. Um, and this is what the state, in terms of the, the um, the local aid payments to, um, as I calling it, temporary holdback. Um, and the, the, hold, the temporary part is there is while they wait for federal aid and economic rebound to fill the budget gap. The updated financial plan projects a $14.5 billion drop in revenue for the year, which is $1.2 billion, um, it's a $1.2 billion decline from the estimate in the enacted budget. So as we all know, um, COVID has taken a, a, a terrible toll on the lives and health and safety of everyone in New York and across the country and across the, the globe. Um, it has also um, hit the pocketbook of the state. Um, and we anticipated that, as we know, in the in, in enacted budget. There was the governor has uh, repeated that there could be cuts to education aid. Um, what it looks like now is that time is upon us, that the 20% holdback for um, and, and state aid, excuse me, state education aid payments um, may be upcoming. While the the state will take it day to day to determine what um, what the revenues look like and which aid payments um, need to be withheld, they have been taking the approach that the 20% is necessary to preserve cash and keep the budget balanced. What we are seeing, what we'll be seeing, is that the first large aid education payments will be going out um, as is typical. Um, and so that is where that 20% holdback will become clear to, um, to schools and districts. So I want to make sure, we want to make sure that the association folks are aware of that. Um, we are gonna keep tabs on what's happening when. I'm happy to take questions on that based on what we know right now. But again, I wanna let folks know, we wanna let folks know that the 20% um, holdback may be coming to districts near you quickly. Um, in terms of the uh, the upcoming aid payments in September and August. Um, again, not 100% confirmed, but based on the financial plan update um, and what the state has been doing so far, uh, we should expect that. What I wanna say again is um, that schools should be aware of that so that um, 
you can make determinations about what the impacts might be and prepare for that. Um, and I want to say to everyone, as we've said before, um, let's you know keep rallying too for that federal aid. Um, we need it. Time's up. So now I'm going to pivot. Again, uh, following up on a question last, asked last week, we received an answer from the CARES Act team confirming that the application does require a hard copy signature. Uh, these applications were due on the 15th, so we are closing the loop on this. Um, again, the hard copy signature, that is confirmed. Uh, David, a memo was re released yesterday regarding emergency response plans. I'm going to pivot to you now. Can you speak to what specific actions schools should take, especially those that previously had emergency response plans created? Thank you. Thank you very much, Yamika. I appreciate it. Um, and so yesterday we, we did send, uh, so this is, um, this is actually only for charter school leaders outside of New York City. This does not apply to New York City charter schools. But uh, the, and I'll post a link to the uh, memo, which is on our website, it's in the chat. But um, it's just, a, it's a, a reminder that um, charter schools do need to uh, develop and submit school building level emergency re response plans, um, as well as district wide safety plans. Uh, school level response plans are confidential and are shared with, uh, with the state police. Uh, district-wide safety plans should be public uh, and posted on your website. So um, yeah, I think the, the memo is pretty self-explanatory. This is not a new um, this is not a new requirement. This is a reminder of an existing requirement. Uh, there are detailed directions on how to submit um, school building level uh, response plans and district-wide safety plans uh, in the memo. Uh, and should you have any questions, feel free to reach out to our office or uh, if you want to go right to the direct source, you can uh, reach out to student support services at the state ed department. Okay, great. I think that completes the list of um, questions we have in advance. We have a lot of questions coming up in the, um, in the Q and A. So I think we'll turn now to directly to the Q and A or, and or we can, I see in there some questions on the financial plan 20%. Yeah, and I realized, Yamika, um, belatedly that I, I, this is my fault because I kicked it off, didn't ask Susie, David, and um, Jennifer to share their updates. So maybe we can turn to that and then, Yamika, um, you take a beat and look at those 20% questions um, and follow up in a little bit more detail to the extent that you can about the uh, potential implications for the governor's announcement. Sounds good. Susie, David, Jennifer, um, updates for any of you? And my apologies, um, I, 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 I did did your Mika dirty by by opening up in the wrong in the wrong way. The developing story, so you have to be fleet footed. Um, I'll dive in. Uh, would love to thank everybody of our schools that got us all of those reopening requests uh, in on Friday. Thanks a bunch. Um, there appear to be a couple of things I just wanted to uh, mention here so that we were kind of clear about them, at least across the any charter schools. Um, as we asked for school calendars, um, there were, as there is the autonomy in charter land to be, lots of variability, but it was unclear if everybody understood um, kind of where the where the outskirts of that autonomy are. And so just a reminder, the Ed Law says that charter schools have to provide calendars and schedules that provide at least as much instruction time during the year as other public schools. Um, but charters are, the SUNY charters at least are not held to the nice at 180 day calendar schedule. We do have 170 days in our contract, but really your uh, minimum instructional time for grades K to eight is 900 hours, seven to 12, 990 hours. If I'm talking to the choir, then uh, that was just kind of a reflection on the variability that we've seen across the plans that we've been able to look at so far. Um, the, other, uh, the other piece I wanted to point out is we aren't seeing um, a high level of detail across the plans for um, 
how schools are going to ensure that English language learner parents will, um, will have access to the virtual program and access to school events, et cetera. Um, it may be that those plans are gonna become firmer and emerge. Um, but again, as we talk about the, the uh, all of our kiddos we know are the most vulnerable kiddos um, in this coming year, but um, we wanna make sure that uh, we pay attention to access and equity issues across all of our parents, but certainly parents who are uh, parents of English language learner students. So um, we welcome input suggestions. Um, we're kind of thinking about uh, trying to do a webinar maybe where uh, as the school year develops, some of our schools that have some best practices can share them out um, because we think this is gonna be an ongoing opportunity for us to build our muscles and capacities this year. And I think that's it for me. Okay, great. Uh, David? I uh, actually, I don't have much to report this, uh, this week. We're, we're reviewing all of the reopening plans and um, uh, our renewal applications. But otherwise, uh, we'll continue to work with our schools uh, as they prepare for the 2021 school year. Okay, I'm going to put you on the spot and ask if you can either confirm or um, let us know the CARES application, a couple of questions in the Q&A. Um, I said that the, the application were due August 15th. We're getting word back that it's August 31st. If you can either confirm that now or just offer us to uh, confirm that for us later. I, uh, I, I received a lot of those questions as well. Uh, the application was, was due. Um, however, schools could receive a, uh, an extension um, if you need to, uh, if you need an extension in time, I would uh, I would reach out uh, to the applicable office to the um, email that was in the memo and ask for an extension. Uh, but I will uh, double check that it hasn't changed. I don't believe it has. Uh, and again, some schools might have a different deadline because they've asked for an extension. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay, I'm looking in the Q&A and I see a couple questions about the 20% the cut. Here's what we know so far. Um, the 20% cut, um, to the extent that the districts see that in their next payments, and there's payment due, I believe, in August, and their larger one will be uh, in September, to the extent that there are, there are cuts to those payments. Um, and I'm going to ask, uh, I'm going to put Anna on the spot to correct me if I, if I overspeak or get this wrong, um, that the school districts will be making the the, the, the charter tuition payments, um, they, to the extent that they are reduced by 20%, I would say that it's, it's, it would be a, an act of generosity for districts, possibly, in, in their view, to um, not reduce the charter um, payment aid. However, the charter school, the, the uh, tuition um, calculator, or the tuition payment amount, is set in statute, which is law. Um, so I would not say that that is a firm and absolute, um, um, but I don't want to have anyone underprepared for that, um, that possibility. Um, but the charter formula is clear in the statute. Um, I don't, I'm not aware of any other authorization to reduce charter school payments, um, and, and I'll, I'll say that very clearly and carefully for any lawyers on the phone. I am not aware of any authorization to reduce charter payments. As I see it, um, the charter school payment amount is set in statute. Statute is law. Um, so that should, that should sort of reign supreme in terms of what charter schools should be paid. To the extent uh, that you, do, you receive something less than that, um, whether it's 20% or any other amount, please let us know, and we will be certain to follow up. So I think that um, there's a variation on the 20% on that question um, in terms of whether it apply to gen ed or, or, or special education. Um, and I, as I said, I think all of that applies that um, in terms of charter payments, in terms of tuition, that holds if it's a non-statutory payment, um, th then the answer you know, is, is, is different because there's no statutory requirement or because if there is no statutory requirement in terms of, in terms of the amount that has to be paid, um, the school districts may even may feel that they certainly have uh, more discretion. Um, and the best advice I can give right now is um, you bill for what you should, you should be billed for, um, expect, um, 
you know, that you that there may be some um, adjustments to that. I'd like to, as we used to say um, in other places, um, don't lead with your chin on that um, and assume that you're going to get the 100% knowing what the, the – um, the fiscal reality is um, in terms of what the school district is receiving. Make note of everything. Let us know, and we will work to try to get those answers in terms of how that's going to get resolved. So I think that covers all of the 20% questions. Um, yes, the 20% questions. I will say I'm getting um, some texts on my phone. We're, do, we're going really multimodal here about the CARES Act funding which is that, the, as David is saying, the deadline is definitely 815. The business portal says 831, but there is nothing that says the deadline has been changed. So I think the headline is, if you have not applied for CARES Act funding and you intend to, immediately reach out um, and request an extension, and you are likely to get it. Um, given that discrepancy and the, the date that's listed in the portal, but don't assume that if you submit something on August 30th without prior communication that it will be accepted. Um, and if anyone is listening in um, and needs that email bump to the top of their inbox, um, feel free to let us know. But there's not a link. It, it came out in an email with a series of um, uh, attachments. Unless, David, you're aware of a link that has been created subsequently. Yeah, I, I shared the link, and, and Mark says that the uh, SED did an extension to 831. So they don't always share everything with, with me. So if you have that documentation, I think that's great. Um, but uh, given uh, that you can easily ask for an extension, or if people haven't received that documentation, I would just recommend that you email and, and ask for the extension. Um, I'd say always better safe than sorry. So. Um, you can, uh, I, I gave a link to the memo, and then here is the direct information that you can, uh, uh, that you can reach out to just request an extension if you don't have the documentation like Mark does. Again, I, it only takes an e an one email, and, and uh, it's potentially a lot of money. So I would say CYA, at, just uh, make sure that you, uh, you, uh, you get that extension if you haven't submitted already. And I'll just add that just for folks who may not have been following along or, or heard it, um, all of that stems from the fact that uh, we mentioned that you do have to actually have a hard signature for those documents. So if you submitted it without that um, and you think it's in and it's fine, it's before the 15th, um, please go back um, uh, and correct that and do it as soon as possible, as Anna and David had said. All right, Anna, I'm going to turn it over to you now as I think the 20% questions are done, and we're going to go straight to the Q&A. Yes, and I've been fielding some, um, I think that the 20% and the CARES Act um, really uh, were the majority of the Q&A questions. And so I'm just gonna um, turn it right over to Corey and Anjali. Great, thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I think, Anjali, are you on or am I being joined by Jen? I will take that silence to mean that I have the honor of. Excellent. <laughs> Great. Uh, thank you for joining us. Um, I know Erin is out this week. So uh, many of you know Jen Schumann from the DOE. Uh, she will be answering some questions. I did want to start. Oh, she's going to go on video too. So that means I can go on video. I always try to match my speaker. Hello, folks. Um, so I wanted to start with just a couple of announcements. Um, I think uh, yesterday we sent out uh, RSVP uh, for another session with the Department of Health and the DOE uh, for this Friday at one, which has started to become a regular thing because we are getting so many questions, uh, particularly health related. We are also, I know uh, DOE, Anjali and Jen are working hard to make sure that there are other folks from different DOE divisions on the call. Um, so Jen, I don't know if you wanna put, uh, if you know who will be on the call for this Friday, um, but I know that you have uh, registration information to share with folks. Um, there's two things we're asking you to do. One is register, and the second is to make sure that you submit any questions in advance um, so we can continue to work through those uh, questions. Um, there was also a bunch of other things that came out uh, late last week uh, from DOE, and so um, we just wanted to make sure that all the schools on this call were aware. Um, the first is an 
updated uh, DOE, DOH health policy um, for those schools that are following the DOEs very strictly or if you're in co-located space, um, there were some updates to that plan. Um, we'll put a chat here. We'll put a link in the chat as well uh, for those who might have missed it. Um, also, I'll add when I stop talking for a minute, a link to the Charter Center took notes at the session last Friday. Um, and so if you want kind of an update on like what were some of the main changes in the DOE's health policy from the first one submitted on July 31st to now, you can find that in there. Um, and obviously you can contact me if you have any questions specifically. Um, Jen, I will let you talk about what has come out about nurses in New York City for charters and, uh, and all spaces. Yes, so as we announced in the C Weekly last week, the city has committed to putting a nurse in every school building. We are still working on the details of when you can contact those folks and what the notification will look like. And we'll share more information as it becomes available. Up, uh, Jen, if you could talk about the use of outdoor space if co-located schools are needing to do a pickup of materials, technology, and supplies. Yes. Uh, schools can use the outdoor space outside the school building for pickup of laptops or dissemination of supplies, but it needs under certain conditions. First, no one is to enter the school building. And second, it should be a grab and go. Uh, we understand that you'll, there may be discussion of kind of an orientation or kind of a long-term consultation, but urge you to err on the side of safety and keep those interactions as limited as possible. And you can use the, uh, the building request form for that process. Great. Uh, next up, um, I'm gonna actually move to a quick question that we got in, because I know this is uh, one of the areas you specialize in. Uh, some schools have been asking if they're offering pre-K, um, are they allowed to have class rosters of 18, even though the uh, health department uh, regs on the pre-K classes say you can have no more than 15 kids in a room at any time? The answer is yes. However, there's a strict limit for safety purposes on 15 students in a room maximum at any time. So if in that case, if you are, if your space allows for a maximum of 15 kids to be in the room safely together, you can have another three students on your roster that are being served virtually. We also want to make sure schools are mindful of the limitation of serving only one pot of students per day, especially if your site is located in a DOE building to be cognizant of the health and safety requirements involved in thoroughly cleaning that space before another group of students comes in. Um, we know, uh, I think everyone has seen in the C Weekly that uh, DOE is requesting the first uh, day of in-person service classes for every charter school. Um, can you talk a little bit about, I know that was already past due, but why you guys need this information? Um, many different reasons. Um, want to make sure that we're informing all of our partner offices appropriately about your plans. And it's especially important to inform preparation for making sure that we have adequate nursing services at each site. So please, please, please take a look in the last C weekly. If you have not already submitted, please submit ASAP. Um, I think we also heard last week that uh, DOE, uh, charter teachers will have access to the expedited testing um, I know that it came out that schools will need to provide a letter on letterhead for each teacher from the principal, but schools are still seeking information on what are those magical 34 sites that they can go to to get this expedited testing. Any updates? We are still working on this. We promise to share information as soon as we can. Okay. Um, also, uh, school, this was a question in the chat, but I will ask it just because uh, I think if, in case someone missed it, what happens if schools are uh, starting virtually, but students still need access to school food? What will be what will be the process? We are still working out the process for this. Um, some more information to come. Okay. Um, I'll also ask you um, any updates on when the DOE calendar will be released. Sadly, no. Okay. 
as everyone knows, they, everything I read in the press tells me it's going to be September 10th. So until we hear otherwise, that's what we've been, what we've been thinking. Um, I did want to bring up because we had uh, someone from state SED on transportation on, are there any updates that you can share about busing? I know that you guys have been very clear about MetroCard distribution, but we are obviously, uh, schools are very interested on busing, whether it's now or later, how that's going to work. Not yet, but I promise that we're continuing to work on this. Um, okay, and the last thing I wanted to ask you is schools continue to ask on terms of if a positive case comes in once the kids are back in school or hybrid school, what should a school do if they receive notice from a teacher or a student that they have, uh, that they're positive for COVID-19? So we have specific steps um, and I'm gonna put those into the chat. Uh, if you report a positive, if you receive a report of a positive COVID-19 test from a teacher or a student, you're gonna call the DOHMH hotline at 866-692-3641. And I'm gonna put that in the chat right now. Um, that's open Monday through Friday, I'm sorry, Monday through Saturday, 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. DOH will call you back and that is the official process. There's no specific contact for each charter school. We want every charter school using the official protocol. Um, getting a question in the chat, are there any updates to school hours and amount of staff allowed in the building for the week of August 31st? Sorry, no updates yet about working on this and know this is an urgent concern as schools are wanting to prepare their building for the start of the year. Yep. Um, in terms of uh, nurses uh, being available for all charter schools in New York City, I think the answer is yes, but can you just confirm, Jen, this is for, this is for even charter schools in private space? as well. Working on the details, but the mayor has committed to one nurse for every every building. Um, I see someone's asking if the DOE will commit to September 10th. They will not. That is just me saying that. Sorry if I confuse people. So yes, no, there, there's no firm commitment from the DOE of when they're starting. They just always have started generally on September 10th, or that's what it would have been. So that's why I say that. Corey um, saying, call her at midnight on September 9th and she'll confirm for you. <laughs> I apologize. <laughs> um, a lot of folks, I, I, I see, we're seeing a lot of comments. People need more info and a timeliness. I know DOE is well aware uh, the time, like, time is clicking down. Um, I think that's all I see in the chat uh, specific to DOE. I do see a question about the billing stuff and cuts and I'm gonna defer all of that because I think as Yumika made clear, we yet don't know what if cuts are coming, when they're coming. And so I, I'm not gonna make the DOE uh, say where or how the cuts will be applied, but we will absolutely stay on top of it and, and get back to you as, as we know more. Um, so with that, Yumika, I will turn it back over to you. All right, thank you, Corey. If you don't um, and me, um, just just uh, scooting in here for a second, uh, I did confirm that the uh, the deadline for uh, uh, Easter applications did move to the thirty first. So I'll I'll send out an email just so you have something in writing uh, right now. All right, great. Thank you, David, for that. Um, thank you, everyone. We will keep you posted on the twenty percent. Um, and we ask that you do the same. Let us know if you're hearing something back from the district in terms of your um, impact on any of your payments. Uh, we want to help you work through this. Uh, we're hoping that the, that cuts don't come um, and that um, the federal aid comes in. We need the advocacy on that. We need to uh, turn this around. So um, with that, I'll wrap up for today. We'll see you again on Thursday uh, for our next webinar. And until then, be well. Stay in touch.